Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I'm glad for those of you who are here in person and for those who are joining us virtually, whether in real time or at some point later in the week, we're grateful that you're taking time out to join us in worship. I want to say thank you to those of you who are here in person for your diligence in masking. It helps us uh, keep our worship a welcoming and inviting place for those who are vulnerable and for uh, children. Uh, my own kids are just uh, across the way doing some Sunday school in my office, but I know um, that they feel safer here for it. And it helps us stay open for in-person worship. We want to stay together as long as we possibly can. And so part of that is doing our part to uh, slow and stop the spread of the coronavirus. I want to make sure that you all know that Ad Council We'll be meeting this Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. here in the Fellowship Hall. And so uh, we'll be doing lots of things that just cover the business of the church and making sure that uh, everything is taken care of for the, the administrative life of our church. And you are welcome to come and join us for that. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? All right. Then let us join our voices together in our call to worship. That is last week's call to worship. It is. Okay, well, we can still use it. <laughs> we'll roll with it. Okay. We are on a journey. We find ourselves in a wilderness that has become all too familiar. Yes, but this is a journey of faith. Isolation, pandemic, death, economic chaos. Need we go on? This is a wilderness that is trying our very souls. This is why I bid you come. Come with the Spirit's power and remember God's faithfulness. Come rest. Worship in the presence of the abiding love, Jesus, love of Jesus, and be renewed. Let us worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. Our opening song this morning is just a closer walk with thee, number 2158. Yes, it is. So we're gonna we're gonna go to the thin hymnal. I think we have last week's PowerPoint coming up. It yeah, it may have just I changed the date and then copied it, so it may it just as last week's. So that's okay. We'll we'll roll with it. Twenty one fifty eight.
as I share a prayer of confession on our behalf. Gracious God, as we gather today, we confess that there have been times when we have dimmed our light and have not faithfully shared the love of Christ. We have kept our distance from the people you call us to serve. We have, in our own isolated places, used these days to become numb to the needs of those around us. We pray that in the depth of your mercy, that you will forgive our sins and free us to be the people you need us to be. We offer ourselves as those who find joy in our salvation, as we continue to be your people, and as you continue to be our God. Forgive us, we pray. With joyful hearts, hear now these words of assurance. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thanks be to God. Our scripture this morning comes from Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. Part of this will be familiar to many of you. We're going to begin with the fourth verse and read to verse 14. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's seventy years are completed will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then. When you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before I begin a prayer, I offer this prayer as we examine the word together. Your word, O oh Lord, is a light in this journey of faith. Open our eyes that we may see your way. Open our ears that we may hear your truth. Open our hearts that we may know your presence. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're in the second week of a series called Living in a Strange Man strange land and offers us biblical wisdom for entering a new normal. Now when I chose this series and decided that we would spend the month of September and a few weeks into October journeying together through the Bible's wisdom for finding a new normal, I really had little intention of even mentioning in my sermon time the fact that yesterday was a historic anniversary, the 20th anniversary of September 11th, 2001. But the funny thing is, God often takes what I plan to do and tells me, um, that's cute. <laughs> because what actually happened is that over the course of the week, as I was reading and studying this text and the commentaries about it, I had a vivid memory of standing on the stage at Richardson Auditorium at Southwestern College in Winfield, Kansas. 
in May of 2005, on the day on which I would graduate college. And reading from this very text to offer what I now realize was my very first sermon to my fellow graduating class, offering a word of hope from the prophet Jeremiah as we headed off into lives we could have no idea yet what they would hold. But what I did know was that we as a class had been bonded from a very early time. You see, if you're counting backwards, you might realize that the graduating class of 2005 were but a few short weeks into their freshman year at Southwestern, when the blue skies normally filled with air traffic on its way to a variety of airports in Wichita, including McConnell Air Force Base, went silent. And we, for the first time, encountered historic and life-changing events not as sheltered children in a classroom or our parents' living rooms, but as young adults who would now be entering this new and unknown world. We had people on our campus from all over the United States and all over the world, and all of us wondered what this moment in history might hold for us. We didn't yet know exactly how the world would change. Some of those changes we watched unfold over the next four years as we were together on that campus. Others were even slower to unfold. And we couldn't yet imagine. But what we knew was that we had experienced something life-changing together that we had formed community. And what I knew standing on that stage in May of 2005 was that that sense of community was something that was a gift. It was something that God was calling us as a graduating class to carry out into the world and to repeat. To continue to figure out what it meant to care for one another as neighbors, as brothers and sisters. And this is part of the call that Jeremiah offers to the people. And you may be familiar with the part where it says, For surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for your harm, that you may have a future with hope. Usually around April and May, you can find it on all manner of crosses and plaques and tote bags and the front of journals and things that uh, are then going to be marketed as graduation gifts to give to young people who are marking a milestone that separates one part of their life from another. But I fear that perhaps when we only know this text by itself, we lose some of the tension of you see, it's true that God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for your harm, but that good news comes in the context of a hard word in which God is telling the people to settle into exile. Let me be clear, they don't want to be in Babylon. They have come to Babylon as refugees. They are in a strange land. It is not the place that they would like to be. And through Jeremiah, God tells them, settle in. Build houses. Invest not just financially, but with your lives in the place where you are. God tells them to plant gardens and eat what grows there. Now, I have a little plaque that uh, usually in the spring I hang out on our, our little front porch 
Uh, it used to, to hang in a different area of a different house. But it says, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. It's a reminder to me that planting is an act of faith. In particular, our household has a few superstitions about such things. You see, early planting, early in the spring, we tend to only plant container plants. Because the other thing that happens in early spring, if you are a United Methodist pastor, is that you go every Monday to the website and check to see whose moves have been announced and every time your phone rings, you check to see that it's not your DS calling. And if it is, your breath catches in your chest. I have a story I like to tell on one of my former DSs that he once called me in the middle of moving season and took a little too long to get to the part where he says this is not an appointed call. And I thought I was going to pass out. Because it was not a year in which we were anticipating a move. It was not a year in which our churches had asked for a move. And it was not a year in which we had any desire to move our family. And I remember wondering if my heart would start beating again if he didn't get to the point pretty quickly. Turns out he just wanted me to serve on the board of the ministry. I still give him a hard time about that. So it's hard for us in spring, when many people are putting plants into the ground, to bring ourselves to do that because uh, we've begun um, to have a number of what I call itineracy superstitions. That there are certain things that from January till about April you don't want to do. Things like order address labels <laughs> or new checks, build anything new in the parsonage or plant a garden in the ground. But here God is calling the people to work the land. Invest in making the ground good. Tend the plants and eat what they grow. He goes on to tell them that they need to marry and have children, and then to let their children marry and have children. Settle in. Get comfortable here. I can imagine that's not what the people wanted to hear. In fact, I venture, and many commentators do too, to understand that part of the warning that God offers about not letting the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you is about the people who were all too ready to tell them what they wanted to hear. It'll all be over soon. We'll be back to normal soon. Don't unpack. We're going home soon. And instead, God speaks through Jeremiah with a very different message. Settle in. Invest in this place. Not just building houses and, and planting gardens, but seek the welfare 